Hello, today we're continuing with our GCSE Physics Revision series looking at the scientific process. Scientific process is very important in all branches of science, including physics. And the important thing is that it is a discipline. There is a procedure through which you have to go if you are going to produce credible scientific theories. And critically, this is not guesswork. You cannot just make any old statement on the basis that it seems plausible. It's no use saying the moon is made of green cheese because that is not a scientific statement. So how does science actually work? Well, it starts with you making an observation. It can be any observation you like. You see something, you observe it. That is, if you like, an experiment. The next stage of the scientific uh, process is you ask the question, why? Why did what you observe happen? When you dropped the ball, why did it fall to the ground? When you throw the ball up in the air, why does it come back down again? The next stage is you have to come up with some kind of theory, or we call it hypothesis, to explain what you have observed. And when you do that, that theory, that hypothesis, will come up with predictions about what ought to happen next time you do something of this kind. So it will say, well, the next time you throw the ball in the air, you should expect it to come down again. And that leads you to conduct another experiment to see if your theory is right. And there are only two possible outcomes of that experiment. Your theory will either be confirmed or it will not be confirmed. Now, either way, the route is very simple. When you've got to this stage where your theory has been either confirmed or not confirmed, you return to the theory. If the experiment confirmed your theory, you go back to that theory and you enhance it. You look for other ways in which you can develop that theory to predict more things that give rise to more experiments to test those predictions. And if they are confirmed, you go back and you develop the theory still more to come up with further predictions. But if the experiment does not confirm your theory, then you have to go back to the theory and instead of enhancing it, now you have to change it. You'll have to change the theory so that you have a new theory with a new prediction and you can test that by way of experiment. And this leads to one very key important thing in science, that is that experiment trumps theory. If the, if the experiment and the theory do not agree, it's the theory that will have to change, provided, and this is the key thing, provided you have taken due care in the, conduct of your, in the conduct of your experiment in the first place, so you can rely on the results you've obtained. If that's the case, if your theory does not accord with the results of that experiment, then however elegant that theory may be, it has to go. So if it's important to take care when you conduct an experiment, what does that mean? It means that the results you get from that experiment must be credible. What does that mean? Firstly, they must be reproducible. If I conduct an experiment and get a set of results, I should be able to conduct that experiment again and get pretty much the same set of results. And more importantly, somebody else, somewhere else in the world, using similar but not the same equipment, should be able to reproduce those results if they carry out that experiment. If the experiment gives you a set of results once, but that is not reproducible, then those results are not credible. You need to get good data from your experiment. That means you need to control what are called the variables. There may be many things that might influence the outcome of your experiment. If you throw the ball in the air, and look to see what happens, there might be a difference if it's a windy day to if it's a calm day. You must make sure that you are controlling all the conditions in which the experiment is being conducted. And that may be harder than uh, you think. For physics experiments, sometimes that's fairly straightforward. If you're doing a kind of social sciences experiment where you're looking at the behavior of people, it may be very difficult 
to control all the variables that might influence that behaviour. There must be a fair test. You have to be uh, scrupulous in the way you conduct the test to ensure that you're not in any way biasing it towards the result you may want. And as we've said, you need to repeat the experiment many times to ensure you get the same set of results. And you need to be aware of experimental error. Whenever you conduct an experiment and you make measurements, those measurements are subject to a limit of accuracy. How accurately can you measure the results? And that will determine the extent to which experimental error may impact on the results and thus the results that will be tested against your theory. The conclusions that you draw from the experiment you conduct must be valid. That is to say, beware of coincidences. Things that happen coincidentally rather than because of your experimental work. Make sure you're unbiased. A great temptation with experiments is to try to get the results that your theory predicts. You really should not do that. You should conduct the experiment properly and get the results that you get. And if that turns out to show that your theory is wrong, well, then you'll have to go back to the drawing board and change your theory. You should not try to arrange for the experiment to deliver the results you want. One very important uh, lesson here is Newton's laws, actually called Newton's laws. Why were they called Newton's laws? Because when Isaac Newton developed his laws of motion, or indeed his theory of motion, for 200 years, those laws seemed to fit every single occasion, every single thing was, um, was obeyed Newton's laws. And that's why they were given the name laws. It was thought that that was it. That was the complete definition of all there was when you look at motion. But we've now encountered quantum mechanics and relativity, neither of which say that Newton's laws are wrong, but that they are incomplete that there is something more to it than what Newton himself had identified. So you must never think that any scientific theory is complete and can never be improved upon. That's what people thought about Newton, and yet we now know that there is more to it than his laws. Having conducted the experiment, we get data. We need to organise that data so that it's well presented. There are various ways of doing that. You may present it in a table or in a graph, or on a bar chart, so that the data is presented in as conducive a way as possible to enable you to draw some kinds of conclusions. But what conclusions are you allowed to draw? Well, this is where the discipline really comes in. First, you may only conclude what the data shows. In particular, be very careful about extrapolation. Let me give you an example of what I mean. If you take, for example, Hooke's law and you plot the force on a spring against the extension of that spring, you will find data points that look like this. And you might be concluded, you might conclude that if you join them all together, you get a straight line, which is perfectly true. That is Hooke's law where the force is directly proportional to the extension. But you would be quite wrong if you assumed that you could just extrapolate that line and that the force would always be proportional to the extension because, as we know, there comes a point where the spring essentially is distorted and the actual line would look like that. So always beware of extrapolation. Never assume that because there's a straight line here, that there will continue to be a straight line. Also beware of the fact that correlation does not equal cause. Just because two things seem to be uh, together doesn't mean that one caused the other. Suppose, for example, at school, three children um, got the measles and they all happen to have red hair. It would be entirely wrong to conclude that if you have red hair, you will catch the measles. That was just a correlation, a coincidence. That was not a direct result of the experiment. So what is the experimental process? Again, as I say, it's a discipline. 
It starts with planning. You have to think about how you're going to conduct your experiment. And the very first stage of that is to identify what your hypothesis is or your theory that you want to test by experiment. How are you going to test that? What is the mechanism by which you're going to test your theory? What measurements are you going to take? And what are the limits to your experiment? For this reason, it's sometimes sensible to do a trial run to find out basically the, the extent to which your experiment is capable of testing your theory. What equipment are you going to use? And what is the process that you're going to go through to get you the results that you need? When you conduct the experiment, as we've said, you need to take, you need to take care, sometimes called due diligence. You must make sure that you do everything possible to ensure that your results are the best that you can get. You need to be accurate in your measurements and you need to be aware of the extent to which those measurements will have experimental error. That is the limit to which you can measure accurately. And of course those experiments always need to be repeatable so you can be sure that it wasn't a fluke or that something didn't cause something to happen which was a one-off but is not repeatable. And then you need to evaluate the results that you obtained. That requires you to pre present the data both fairly and in a way that is most conducive to seeing what the results are telling you. You need to draw valid conclusions which are supported by what the data says and nothing more. So do not extrapolate or make assumptions. You can only draw conclusions based on what the data itself shows.